Well, good evening everybody, and this is a very special occasion. We are joined by Mark Sargent, um, and somebody that I've wanted to speak to for quite a long time, even though that I've been on Flat Earth for over three years, I don't think we've ever had a single word between us, although I have watched many of his shows. Mark, how are you? I'm well, thank you for having me. No problem at all, and thank you for agreeing to, to actually come on, actually. Um, I didn't think you'd be so forthcoming, and yes, I, I'm happy to come on and, and, and have a talk with you. It was uh, sure. very refreshing. Sure. Yeah. So, so how's things with you? I mean, I know that um, you've started a new show with Karen B. Yep. Um, would you like to have a little chat about that? Tell the audience about this, because, um, you know, if not many people know, obviously, since you're not doing the secret show anymore, um, Karen B and you are, are doing a little show together. Do you want to explain about that? Right. Uh, yeah, Karen B from the channel, Karen B, you know, veteran flight. I can't speak for, you know, Roxanne. Probably, you know, they're pretty close. Uh, th she, and, she and I have been talking for some time, and we were kind of toying with the idea of having her come on and co-host Strange World. And so she did. And we've been doing that for a couple months now, and it's been going really well. And so every Tuesday night in the States, Karen B. is on with me. And when I am out and about traveling and doing whatever, if I, if I can't do the show, she then takes over the show and runs it on her own. And she brings in other people like Zulu One and Master Gunner. And it's uh, it's going really well. I, I like Karen a lot, and I'll get to see her soon because she's going to be hosting her own conference down in South Carolina on October 21st, I believe. Wow. Um, yeah, I think he was talking. It was it. Uh, let's see. Oh, I've got it written down here somewhere. I was doing a little bit of research before. Was it Bonnie Lake? Uh, no, no, that's a meetup. That's a meetup. Oh, right, uh, that, okay. There's a, there's a meetup that's happening in the Seattle area up in the northwest of the United States which will be September 1st, and I will be attending that one. I don't know if Paul on the Plane and Dee Marble and some of the other guys in the Northwest will be here, uh, but I, I will be definitely attending that one. And then from there, I head over to the UK conference, and I am spend, uh, I think, nine days over in the, the UK doing the, that conference and then jumping over to Stockholm and doing the Gather Festival. They invited me over. Even though the Gather Festival isn't a Flat Earth conference, they invited me to represent the Flat Earth for a day. So I'll be over there as well. Right. Well, that's oh, well, sorry. And then, I'm sorry, then the South Carolina conference, that is October 21st. So it's a whole month, three weeks later. And the, Karen and just Jack and a whole bunch of other people will be down there. Well, I mean, that seems like, it seems like a, a full-time, you know, effort for you. You know, all this, all these, this plane hopping and different countries and stuff like that. But you put it's in the leg been, yeah. It's been surprising. Well, again, everything unsolicited and everything surprising for, for me. Like this year, I didn't think that, I didn't know that Flat Earth was going to be on tour. And yet, you know, I've already done three conferences. I did Los Angeles and then I did, um, Auckland, New Zealand, and I did Calgary up in Canada, and then after that I've, I've still got UK, Stockholm, South Carolina, and then finally Dallas. Wow. And those are, the, those are the, the big meetups, or the big conferences, and then, you know, whatever regional meetups that I, I go to, I go to. But yeah, yeah, it's been, it's been, and oh, and then in between that, I, um, <laughs> you probably don't know, because I haven't told a lot of people, I, I, so I was down in New Zealand at a conference, right? came back to the states and then i was invited because i did uh the today show down in uh australia it, but it was it was remote and a uh, a company a mobile phone company contacted me about uh doing a commercial so they flew me down and i shot a commercial about a month ago down in um melbourne go figure and so that's going to air in australia and then as soon as it does uh, you you think I caught some hell for the documentary? I will really <laughs> catch some hell for the commercial. Can you uh, give us a little tiny sneak idea about why you might get a little bit of hell for that? Oh, because I got paid for it. That's oh, why. Is that all? oh, that's right. So it's, it's a it's a it's oh, okay. a paid. It was a paid gig. I mean, this was not a small time deal. I mean, this is a this is a big big company and. Uh, you know, where I'm, where I'm holding up the phone, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, hold up the phone and smile into the camera, and and uh, they recreated basically this behind me with a lot a lot of other props, and uh, you know, but but you could tell the writers, 
that that hired me, you could tell, you know, because we've got Flat Earth members everywhere. The questions they were asking, only a Flat Earther would ask these questions. And so we've got people on the inside of this company, no question. And so, you know, there was it was a little tongue in cheek, of course. You know, they're they're not going to just come out and say we believe. You know, the, the commercial is about. You know, how, if you can get your head around this, ama- you know, huge topic, you can definitely get our, your your head around our app. Yeah. Uh, but that's what it's going to be about, and uh, so, but it won't air in the states. But I think they'll put it on YouTube. So as soon, I'm trying to get out in front of this thing, because yeah, I I will catch some grief because it is, as far as I know, the first pay paid endorsement well, for Flat Earth. So I I mean I was beat, I was playing myself. You know, they introduced me as Mark Sargent, you know, from behind the curve and. Uh, so yeah, uh, that that'll be fun. <laughs> well, to be fair, that's that's amazing publicity for Fly Earth, and I think people need to get over the fact that you might have made some money out of this because, at the end of the day, I see it this way: you you've been you've the amount of stick you've taken, the amount of effort that you've put in in promoting Flat Earth, uh, the grief yeah. you and all the grief you've done. You, you could have done a job anywhere. Uh, you, you don't have to do Flat Earth, you could have had a job anywhere and, and earned some money. You, you could have earned far more than you ever would do on Flat Earth. And so what if you did right. a little gig and you got some money for it? Who cares? I certainly don't care. I, I And I agree with you. Um, and plus the numbers, it, it's something that I that we've been, uh, we've been teased about by producers for three years now. I mean, people don't, don't remember that we were doing screen tests back in the beginning of 2016 for production companies that were thinking because when something trends on the internet now people want to take advantage of it which is you know and flat earth has been trending pretty solidly for three plus years you know to where it just gets getting bigger and bigger and bigger and so bigger producers come in and they get scared or they get cold feet uh, but there have been some amazing people that in production houses that have been looking, trying to turn this thing into something outside of the internet, like a television show. Uh, well, for example, the documentary. The documentary was was done by a very small production house that had nothing to lose, and they didn't even think it was going to do anything. And then all of a sudden, and and they were they were not necessarily being negative; they were being realistic. And it's like, well, we probably won't get enough, any film festivals. And then every film festival they submitted it to, they were accepted. I mean, they did 27 film festivals in eight countries to where they couldn't even go out to all these festivals. They, had to, they started to start sending me out because they were getting double booked. And then they said, well, okay, it did some well in the film festivals. It's not going to be purchased, though, by any distributor. And then it was picked up immediately by Amazon and Google Play and iTunes and, and YouTube Red. And then finally Netflix. I mean, they all bought it. And and you know and then it trended from there. So you know the the numbers p- panned out, and be, because of the documentary, the the company down in Australia, they're like, oh yeah, this is kind of cool. Let's let's see what we can do with it. And of course, it helps when you have people on the inside. Mm. So and you know, will there be a television show? I have no doubt there will be a television show. Then you cannot. It keeps coming up, keeps coming up over and over and over again. I mean, the backlog of content that we've got in in our archives now you could do a show easily a dedicated weekly show and so yeah and and of course there'll be money behind it so it's just a question of you know what what they want us to do you know is there an integrity issue uh and you know but but yeah you're right the exposure is priceless yeah. look if there's a television commercial that they open up with three things they name me, so you can look me up. They name the documentary, you can look that up, and they they bring up Flat Earth more than once. What more exposure do you want? And and it's running on all channels down there. I, I guarantee that that commercial will turn into something bigger. Yeah, that's awesome. And th- the thing is, I mean, a lot of people won't find it palatable, right? That's just the way it is. I mean, it's just how the community has kind of made this situation about anybody that tries to make money out of of the work that they do but then again they don't realize the amount of effort and time and, and work ethic you need to, to do this the amount of, oh yeah yeah the amount of grief you have to suffer the amount of personal time that you put into this um oh, yeah. it is a yeah. it's a, it's a 24 hour seven day a week and it's in your head as well all the time. oh yeah yeah that's this is that's that's all i do i do flat earth it's, i mean i live and breathe it uh, I travel. I do public speaking. When I'm not doing that, I'm making videos. I'm not making videos. I'm watching videos, or uh, you know, the emails don't stop. The phone calls don't stop. Uh, luckily, I don't do much texting, but I still get some texts from people, even though I say don't text me because I, I hate texting. Um, 
and yeah, it's that's what I do all all the time. And so you know, something to pay the bills wouldn't hurt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, so I'm waiting. It, it'll be probably two minutes after that commercial comes out where the first comment will be, you know, in all caps, sell out, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, the, the cliche thing where, you know, it, you're, it's, it's funny because this happens in just about every form of, of, of life and business, including, um, entertainment, you know, more than, you know, you're a garage band and you're cool until you sign a record deal, then you're a sellout. It's like, what are you talking about? That's that's the whole point of being in a garage band. They all want to. But if you don't get the deal, you're pointing at the guy and, and claiming sellout. It's like, fine, fine. It's like, it, it, if it wasn't, if, you know, if I didn't say yes to this, because it's a fine, it's a good commercial, mm. in my opinion. And you'll you'll have to see it. To, well, you know, of course, I haven't seen the final edit, cross my fingers. Uh, but uh, it's there are flat earthers on the inside. I know I met them. Mm. You could always tell who the flat earthers are because they want to have selfies taken with you. <laughs> so. Well, there's a there's a fi there's a fine line I think in in flat Earth, and it's like I was just explaining to you just before we talked. Uh, when I first joined Flat Earth, um, I had it, it wasn't it, I didn't even realise there was a path to choose from. I genuinely didn't. It was like I just was following my nose, and I didn't even realise there was factions inside of Flat Earth. Right. And there's the factions of people that 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 want to do this as a business and make a little bit of money out of it and put a lot of time and effort into that, right? right. And then there's the other side that just want the information and just want to talk about it and don't want to monetize the channels and don't want don't want anybody else making money out of this. And, right. you know, it's... Oh, yeah, because it, yeah, it should always be free, you know. The truth should be free. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not charging a subscription service for my, my YouTube channel. I didn't even monetize it for the six, first six months. It wasn't until YouTube wrote me directly and asked me, they said, hey, maybe you should think about, not one of those, you know, um, network channels, you know, where they say, oh, join our network. It was YouTube directly. They said, hey, maybe you should think about monetizing your channel. I go, fine. I mean, you know, two buttons, click, click, that's it. It's monetized. And, uh, you know, it, it, it helped that I made enough original content because, you know, if you, if you use copyrighted material, which I do in a lot of my stuff, uh, you can't, you don't make a dime off of those because the nickels go to somebody else. Yeah. So, but it's all it's all, it's all changed now. I mean, like a typical video of mine will get about sixteen hundred views from start to finish, and then the rest are just basically just people coming back for a five minute clip or just to respond to a to a to a comment. But what will right. happen is immediately, immediately as soon as the stream's finished or the video's been put out, I get um, a message saying that you can't monetize this video, um, and it has to wait till it reaches a thousand views before they'll even consider it for monetization. Then it normally takes a couple of days or so for them to get back to me and say, "Oh, actually, yeah, we made a mistake. We can monetize your video now." Oh, because it's it's that's part of the uh, the yellow flag system, right? Yeah. Where they say that we don't think your content's appropriate for monetization. That's right. But the yep, problem is yeah, that's because because I'm such yep. a small channel, um, I only have four thousand subscribers, and to get sixteen hundred views is is immense. It's a it's a real achievement for me to 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 pull in that many views. But that means that the entire 1,600 views that people watch it from start to finish aren't actually, uh, well, there, there might be adverts on there, but they're certainly not coming uh, to me. I'm not getting any percentage of that because YouTube have said, no, we're not going to approve it. And what they wait is they wait for the interest to die down on the video and then they approve it. Yep. Yep. And you can also do that. Uh, I've seen um, companies that used to do that with me before the rules changed where was you know they would throw like a full-blown strike and the strike would slow you know while the strike was on the video was down and you know they could they could stall up to three weeks to a month before before it was retracted and yeah within a month it's like well that that knocks it down to the bottom you know bottom of the ladder and by the way you know 4000 subs nowadays is not that bad i mean there are kids out there you got to remember there are there are tons and tons of younger people that are getting into cuz i'm old when i have to say that um, younger people that are getting into youtube and they're just scrambling they're just scraping for anything you know they get 100 subs they're happy uh, any any people again, and of course, you know, there's there's people that buy subs. I didn't even think that was a real. I I didn't know, but it didn't surprise me when I first found out that you could buy subs, and likes, and even comments if you really want to spend the money. And so you see these giant channels that pop up because it's the whole famous for being famous. If you have a million subs, 
there's a logic behind it, which is, oh, you know, you glance by it, a million subs, I should sub, people will sub default to it. Because they think, well, if a million, you know, if, what's the old saying? If a million people jumped off a bridge, would you go jump with them? It's like, yeah, a lot of people would. Mm. Yeah. And so, anyway. Uh, I mean, I've, go ahead. I've fought tooth and nail for every subscriber, I have to say. I mean, it's it's been a, I think this channel's probably three years old or three years worth of content on it. Um, yeah. And I had a previous channel too. So, I mean, a, lot, a few subs that I was on with that came over immediately to this, but it's taken a long time to actually get to 4,000 real subscribers, so I do appreciate every single one of them. One thing right. I, I have noticed, though, is that these, these anti-Flat Earth channels pop up, and within a month or two, they've got 10,000, 15,000 subscribers. Well, again, I'm suspicious of, of quite a few of them. Uh, the only one I'm going to pick on right now would be Simon Dan, because he jumped way up there. In fact... He, it, I knew it was bad because we had some of our own dedicated trolls going after him. <laughs> you know, the the normal our our everyday trolls were saying, "Who the hell is this guy?" Like, there's a competition for trolls, and they were going into. If anyone wants to look up the records, and and you know, you can go to a, a site called Social Blade, and it will show you, you know, way more analytics than what YouTube has. And there was the, like these three days in particular where Simon Dan literally got a million hits combined on his channel every day for three days. And then it dropped down to almost nothing. There was this big burst of, of views. You know, a million, million, million hits every day for three days. Come on. And uh, yeah, so we're now he's, he's got more subs than I do. Yeah. And for, for going against Flat Earth, and I'm sorry, his content is super boring. Yeah, it is. He has I mean, there's there's not much there. I mean, yeah, his thumbnails are, are halfway decent, but it's it's the cliche. You know, they, they say, look, you have to put a face. Nowadays, they say, uh, if you put a face on your thumbnail, it gets more hits. So, whatever. Okay. But, but, yeah. I need yeah. to I need to put somebody else's face on my ones, and if that's the case, <laughs> well, no, no, all you have to do is put a face. Yeah, it doesn't have to be your face. Just okay. has to be a face. You know me; I never put my own face on thumbnails if I can help it, uh, because you know I, I'm so photogenic. But other people <laughs> do, and you know, and they say, "Oh, look at this weird looking." Or, you know, they make they usually take one or two interviews where I'm doing this and. They, uh, yeah, it's scary. I, I did when I was doing the the commercial, for example. Uh, I, I, we spent an, an entire afternoon doing still shots, which I loved so much, right? And mm. and I mean, they took hundreds and hundreds of photos. And at the end, they're going, "Oh, you you want to see some of these?" And it's like, "No, no, I don't. <laughs> I really don't want to see them." I go, "I'll take your word for it. If you like them, great. Get get me away from the camera." So. Sorry, so go ahead. What was the what was the main thing that made? Well, what was the one thing that made you think flat Earth? Of all the things that you ever, you know, when you first started off, what was the thing that made you think, I need to look into this? Or was it just a case that you'd run out of things to actually I literally ran out of things to look at it. The documentary was not a lie in that regard. Uh, I was bored. Uh, I, you know, I was sitting, sitting in my place in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, had done, I'd pretty much finished the internet, in my opinion. You know, I, I looked at just about every conspiracy you could think of and, and was bored. And so I just kind of glanced at it. Now, did it resonate with me right away? No, but I'm a big science fiction fan, so I love Twilight Zone and Outer Limits. In fact, I'm, I'm still finishing up the, the 90s version of the Outer Limits. That ran for seven seasons. I didn't watch most of them because I was busy. Um, but I liked the sci-fi aspect of his flat earth, especially when, when you listen to the Matt Boylan story, uh, it comes off as a really cool science fiction story. And that, that kind of resonated with me. I, I looked at it from a production standpoint. I go, wow, that is a slick, you know, that's, yeah, I go, it may be like a TV movie of the week. It may not be a motion picture, but it's a cool story. I, I should look into this a little bit more. And the more I looked into it, the cooler it got to where it really, really resonated with me. Now, did I think it would resonate with other people? No, I did not. Uh, I, you know, I made the series of videos and I said, okay, I think it's a, I think it's a great concept. And not only that, but I, I think, I, you know, I think it's absolutely plausible, if not likely. And, uh, you know, prove me wrong. And nobody could. Yeah. So that's what that's where it came from. I think for me it was, um, I, well, I know exactly what it was for me. I had, like yourself, I'd run out of content to watch. I think I'd looked at all the different conspiracies. And I'd seen the odd 
video for Flat Earth popping up. Funnily enough, not not one of yours, because I think if I'd have seen one of yours, I might have been tempted to click it <laughs> just because of the mm. name. You know, Flat Earth Clues. Right. You know, it's kind of a one of those draw you in, you know, click kind of thing videos. But nothing really interests me until. Um, Alex Jones put a video out after continu continually saying that Flat Earth was um, uh, nonsense. It was absolute nonsense. Every, anybody that rang through to try and talk to him and discuss Flat Earth, he said they were insane and hung up on them. Uh, didn't right. want to go near it. And the, the day before he put this video out, he was complaining that he just had his whole channel demonetized. Everything had been taken away, so he's like he'd lost. Um, a few different um, people that were sponsoring the show, YouTube had took all the monetization away, and he was really fuming. The following day, a video came out by Paul Joseph uh, Watson on the Alex Jones channel saying, um, oh, what was he called now? Um, some guy, Eddie Bravo, I think it was. Eddie Bravo. Proves the flat earth. Eddie Bravo proves the flat earth. Well, being a big Alex Jones watcher of all his content and stuff, I'm like, that's a bit of a flip around. Why would they put that on? So I watched it. And to be fair, the content wasn't that great. I mean, what Eddie was saying wasn't super great, but it was right. enough to pique an interest. And the following day, I went back to watch the video. It had been removed. And Alex Jones had put a new video up saying, hey, I've got all my monetization back. Woohoo. <laughs> and I was like, hmm, that's not a coincidence, is it? No, that's not coincidental. I wonder what happened there. Was he, was he kind of blackmailing the... The YouTube, uh, Google, etc., uh, by saying, "Hey, if you've demonetized me, I'm going to start talking about flat Earth." And if you, and then suddenly you get monetized again, and I'll remove the video. And that's exactly what he did. And he like got re-monetized. Re he removed the video, and I'm like, "Hmm," because being in, in conspiracies, you think, hmm, "Read into this." So I oh, started. Sure. So I started watching a few videos, and I was hooked, pretty much immediately. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's an it's an interesting concept. I mean, it's very interesting. It's the most interesting story that I can think of. It's polarizing. You're you're not really on the fence about it. You you either love it or you hate it. And uh, and it's deep. It go there's so many different facets to it that people. I mean, you can you can look into flat Earth for a long, 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 long time. It's just a question of how long do you look before all of a sudden you sit back, you take a break, and go, okay, you know what? I think I actually may, may be into this, and uh, you know, and and the the one let me the last thing about it is that it's one of the only topics I've ever seen where everybody knows something about it, even at a basic level. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have yet, out of all the thousands of people I've talked to, never run into a single person that said flat Earth never heard of it. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's heard of flat Earth, and you find me another topic which which you can you can say that about. You know, it's it's amazing. You know, but now people don't know anything. Generally, it's like like I, I people will say, "Well, flat Earth is that a metaphor?" You know, for for crazy people, but they know the term mm -hmm. flat Earth. It's the it's the only conspiracy we debunk to children, which I, again is is a clue in itself. Well, that's it. I mean, they, they do use it as a derogatory term. You know, oh, you're just a flat Earth. You know, like you're insane. But they, they don't actually spend the time to look into the, the, the kind of inner workings of how we've come to this and the, our own science that is, that is leading towards that conclusion, you know, because we are working hard, you know, a lot of people are working hard, especially like people like FE Core and stuff, and they right. have a terrible reputation and I don't know why. I'm part of FE Court and I see the work that these guys are doing. I know what they're going to drop. They're going to drop it soon. They've been working on a bunch of different stuff and it's going to right. blow everyone away. And yet in the meantime, they've got this negative thing that people have, oh, the shills, the this, that. They're only in it for the money. Well, it costs money to do these experiments. It costs right. money, right? Right, it, exactly. And r up until now, you know, when it comes to the money, the only money that's been coming in for anybody has been either donations through whatever. Um, it's been coming in through Google if you're if you're using AdSense and and uh, you know the the whole Google Pay thing for for getting hits on the videos, and that's basically it. Just private private donations. Up until now, you know. So <laughs> again, you people can say, "Oh, you're only doing it for the money." It's like you're making tons off of T-shirts and books. It's like, look. My my second book is coming out. Uh, the first book, you know, people don't really buy books anymore. The book for me is just a reference point because some media won't take you seriously unless you have a book. Mm. 
for example, or a DVD. Uh, you know, like a, the story I'm famous for telling is is when Coast to Coast contacted me out, out of the blue. I didn't contact them, and they said, "Okay, what's the name of your book?" And I go, "I don't have a book." They go, "Okay, what's your DVD?" Don't have a DVD. All right, what's your website? I go, "Look, I've only been doing this a few months. I don't have a website. I just came up with this idea." And you know, they said, "Okay, why are we talking to you?" I go, "You called me." But they're looking for that stuff. They they want an anchor that they can anchor things back to. Um, so yeah, the money. Yeah, of course, people can people can throw it when the television show happens. Fine, you can yell at people for taking you know for for the money aspect. But up until now, nobody gets into flat Earth for for making money. Let's use um Patricia Steer real quick for example. Why and I mean for God's sakes, she knows exactly what she can do. She could have opened up a YouTube channel called Makeup Over Forty, right? For for doing makeup tutorials over forty, which of course. You know, she would have just cleaned up on, but mostly it's because of her genetics. It's like, look what I did in 15 minutes, right? It's, wow, that's amazing. It's like, you could do it too. It's like, no, you can't. <laughs> you know, hers is because of her bone structure. But she could have absolutely cleaned up. So why wasn't she doing that? Why was she doing flat Earth? You know, mm. nobody gets into flat Earth to make money. No. It, because, because who would have known it would have resonated? I mean, when all the media is saying it's a terrible idea and it sucks and you've got all these huge channels just laughing at flat Earth. What makes you think you can make money off of it? Mm. Exactly. It's it's this it's a silly allegation. Absolutely silly. It's like you don't make that much money off of of selling T-shirts. I was surprised. Sorry, let me. I know I ramble, but I was surprised just yesterday when I was looking at the giant YouTube channel Smarter Every Day. Right? He's got millions of subs. He's got a Patreon link on there. It's like why does a guy that has six million subs have a Patreon page? Well, probably because he gets copyrighted on on some stuff, and there's quite a few videos he can't make money off of. And plus, you don't get that much money for make for hits. You only get like a thousand bucks per million hits. That's yeah. not that much. I mean, think of what it takes to get a million hits in a in a video. That, that I mean, it takes a lot. Um, so unless you're Simon Dan. Oh, unless you're Simon Dan. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, in in which case, you can again. But also, that's part of the. Well, uh, sorry. Let me let me use a, a quick example for people that don't know what I'm talking about. Because there's channels out there that just have taken it too far to the point where it's ridiculous. Uh, the most obvious would be PewDiePie, the the biggest channel in the world, right? He's got what 100 million subs right now. And when I when we were getting into this, he had 30 million. Yeah. So he's jumped 60 million subs. Like, and so what happens is this. Uh, you'll you'll get it when I say it. So you and I'm not telling anyone to do this it's a bad it's a super bad idea plus it shows up on social blade which is you buy hits right so you buy let's say you buy a couple million hits or subs for your channel well you get some of that money back because YouTube pays you for the hits so you buy you you pay a, a, an outsourced company a third party company to generate hits on your channel and then some of that hit money comes back to you because Google pays you for the hits well, what do you do? You take some, and then some of those hits you get a reel, right? And so it becomes this this loop. So when do you stop? So you take some of that money and you sink it back into more hits, which generates more subs, which generates more hits, and it just keeps going round and round to where all of a sudden it's like, oh hey, I've got sixty million subs. Well, how many of them are real? And you got to remember what what's the comparison? Um, I don't know. Uh, Justin Bieber and Katy Perry have I think thirty million each. And they actually create content. Here's the thing. If you have 60 million subs, you should be on national television all the time. You should be in movies. You should be on magazine covers all the time. And But if you ever watch PewDiePie's channel, he does nothing. He, he, I mean, he trolls. He's literally a professional troll. That's all he does. He, he, does, he generates no real content. I mean, Katy Perry and, and Justin Bieber, they, they generate tons and tons of, you know, albums and songs and huge media appearances, and they're, they're asked to do, do endorsements all the time. PewDiePie's asked to do nothing, and yet now he's up to, what, 100 million? How? Well, if 100, sorry, 100 million subs, that's, that's a third of the population of the United States. Isn't that more of, like, than the entire continent or the entire island of the UK? Isn't that, uh, yeah, what does he do? doesn't do anything. Sorry. No, that's fine. It's, part, I don't part, think he's part, number one me. anymore, though. I think there was um, I think there's somebody else overtaking him. I'm not sure well, who it was. Again, the point was there have, was this. Yeah. Horse, there was this. I know. I know who you're talking about. I don't even memorize his name because nobody knows this guy. Well, I mean, yeah, if you're under 20, you know this guy. But they were they were in this horse race. It's like what? Because they can generate subs out of thin air. They haven't capped the market already. They're asking for subs, and all of a sudden they get another 800,000 in a day, another million in a day. It's like. 
how, where are you getting these from that they weren't already sub to you? Meaning the numbers have gotten so high they're meaningless. They, they don't they don't make any damn sense. They're they're too they're too high. At this point, he has three times as much as as Katy Perry. Katy Perry, the the one of the highest paid singers in the world, and you know could sell out cons- you know sell out um, stadiums all all day long. He he can go he could walk into a mall in America right now. No one would recognize him unless you were under twenty. And even then, they'd be like, "Is that him?" Sorry. Well, I'm sorry. Let me let me throw this one more thing out at you real quick. If anyone has any doubt what I'm talking about here, there was this video I was watching of him because I was just curious. I was just watching a couple of his things in the intro, and he was pushing. You know, he has like a gaming chair company that was that he's selling gaming chairs that he sits in. I think it was red, and he was begging people to buy this chair. It was only like 400 bucks, right? And he was saying, if I can sell a hundred chairs, they'll give me a price break and I can I can sell sell a bit at cheaper price. I'm going, You've got sixty million subs and you can't sell a hundred chairs? <laughs> come on, what what's wrong with this picture? I know that kids don't have a lot of purchasing power, but come on. You know, there yeah. there's kids that could steal their their parents' credit cards and he could not sell a hundred chairs. So no, no, he does nothing. And plus, he made that huge mistake, you know, with the whole anti-Semitic thing, whatever. So, what do you think about this Logan Paul? Because he was a obviously another internet internet celebrity who, I mean, obviously we knew his background, you know, and a lot. Yeah, of Lo- Logan Paul. When Logan Paul finally leaves this world, and I hope it's soon, he will not be missed in any capacity. He's one of those few people I can actually say the world would be slightly better if he was gone. Uh, he generates nothing but destructive energy, and uh, he's an awful, terrible person. And I say that because of the whole um, the Japanese suicide forest ish- issue that uh, that he dealt with, um, which is if people don't remember uh, that what frustrated me from the um, uh, the Denver conference wasn't that Logan Paul was there, it was that nobody r- knew who he was because the the flat Earth cr- crew generally, like the conference people, generally skew older, and his demographic is teenage boys i mean uh, by that i mean like eighth graders so what what logan paul did was do you remember you old enough to remember the whole uh mtv jackass show yes yeah yeah. okay mtv jackass that's what kind of started the whole thing and johnny knoxville and those guys they had a successful television run and then multiple motion pictures and then they retired before youtube came out so when YouTube came out, uh, Logan Paul and his younger brother Jake decided they were just going to take that over and just do the whole formula and do jackass basically on YouTube and punk anybody they could. And when they ran out of people to punk in the United States, they started going overseas. And the the capper was when he went to Japan and uh, went to the Japanese, a Japanese suicide force. You know, the Japanese take suicide much, much differently than we do. And, you know, kamikazes, you know, it's it's an honorable thing in, in some regards. And he was punking, you know, dead bodies there. And then, you know, filming it and then, you know, not, not live streaming it, filming it, then editing, then releasing it on YouTube. And it was up there for a little while before everyone came down on him like a ton of bricks. And I'm sorry, it's just, it's just, there's some lines you do not cross. And he was just an awful, awful person. So... When he came to Denver, uh, it was it was disheartening because I was one of the only people that did enough internet research that I knew who he was, and I was glad that when he made his his piece against us, that he was so overt about it because I didn't want the last thing I want was him to be tied to us uh, in any sort of uh, ally sort of way. I mean, he was just a, there are some celebrities you you want on your team, and there are others you do not bad celebrities and he is definitely one and remember he's an internet celebrity that's that's all he is he's he's youtube only he'll never break out and do anything else uh he's famous for being famous you know here i was thinking that paris hilton you know was was i thought that famous for being famous would would go away with that but apparently you can buy, remember what i said if you buy enough hits if you buy enough subs you're instantly credible mm. on the internet because it's like, oh look, I mean, I've talked to kids. I've I know this for an absolute fact. Where they say, oh yeah, this guy's got ten million subs. He's total. He's hashtag legit. I'm going, why? Just because you, you you read that number? That number makes him legit. What about his channel? Oh, I don't care. I just look at the number. It's like, oh god. 
Well, you, anyway. made, you made no bones about leaving the conference, though. Um, on the first day, essentially, or before the, even the first day. Before, I mean, before yeah. the first day. Well, the, the, the thing was, not only was uh, Logan going to be there, but he was going to be on stage. Uh, I had I had heard that he was going to have stage time, and again, I, I'm not going to pick on on Robbie because, uh, you know, he did what most producers would do, and that is he saw a pro- never never waste a production value if you can if you can get a hold of it. Uh, but there was a risk which I wouldn't have taken, not in a million years, and I don't think anyone else in the community would have done either. Uh, which is while he, because I knew what he was, and I knew he was just an awful person, and he was trolling us. There was a potential for him to go on stage and do something really, really bad. Now, luckily, Logan chickened out. Once he got up there and realized that even though he brought a whole bunch of his posse there, they were outnumbered 50 to 1. Uh, there there was no way he was going to do it, and so he chickened out. You know, He just dropped the mic and got the hell out of there and then checked out of the hotel and to a different hotel the next day. And in fact, never did come back to the conference. You know, he, he he was so I I had to do it mostly for a statement to the community, which was, look, I care about the community a great deal. And you there are some people there. There's some people you ju- you just do not want anywhere near because they've just got bad energy around them. And there's a whole bunch of other celebrities I could name that, that do the same thing. But he was definitely uh, the one that got closest to us and he didn't infiltrate us. Uh, he just he just came in and and we let him in the door because we thought it's like okay well you know maybe this time he'll you know he'll do something positive he's never made a serious video his entire life ever you know he made hundreds and hundreds of videos never made a serious one it's like oh because he's going to make a serious one now now he's going to grow up at the ripe age of 24 Hmm. he's gonna he's gonna make a a serious documentary about flat earth and, and ask the tough questions no no he was he was the perfect example of um, uh, the old story, uh, the scorpion and the frog, if you know that one. Yeah, I do. Yeah, so I mean, he was he was gonna sting us, and the only pain for me was I had to wait three months to see it. Mm. So when his piece came out, and and he made fun of Robbie, I felt bad because he torched Robbie in that video. Yeah, and it's like, oh man, it's you know, and Robbie doubled down, and he was like. It's like, no, no, I think it'll be good. And it's like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> don't think so, man. So, anyway. So, uh, we were talking a little bit, um, as I say, just before we went live. Um, and, you know, we were talking about what your role, what you, how you figure your role essentially is in this, in this community and what it is that you, you do um, and how you go about promoting stuff. So, you right. know, would you like to talk about that or are you... Sure, 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 sure. Uh, I am, uh, again, you've heard me say it officially, I'm the freshman recruiter for the metaphorical place called Flat Earth University. I am the tour guide for the Flat Earth campus, which is I get you in the door. Usually, if you get into Flat Earth, there's a high degree of probability you're going to run into my stuff first. And if you do, or you're going to come back to my stuff, because the other people that put out stuff is, is generally, if... In, in the United States, you know, we have um, books for first year, second year, third year, and fourth year. And there's not a lot of first year books. Mine definitely is one of them, though. And I get you in the door, and then from there, you decide what role you're going you're gonna to take in Flat Earth, whether it's going to be street activism or experiments or bashing NASA or meetups or conferences or music. Take your pick. There's so, there's so many different things you could do. But... But because of that, I have to keep it very general. I have to throw a very, very broad net. And uh, I can't, like, for example, the, the most common criticism I get is that, for example, either I'm not Christian enough or I'm too Christian, <laughs> which is a tough thing to be um, both, okay. which cause I, was, I was raised in a, a born-again Christian family. Uh, but I fell away from religion when I went to university years ago, and then um, uh, Flat Earth brought me back. But because of that, I realized, you know, as I've gotten older, look, I'm older now. Uh, look, there are five major religious houses in this world, and they all have a piece of this puzzle. And so I can't alienate, even though I'm, you know, from the United States you know, and I'm from a Christian side of things, and I favor Christianity, sure. But I, I can't, for example, uh, just start quoting a lot of chapter and verse when I'm, when I'm doing interviews. And because the media won't do it. Media will not, will not talk to you. 
if, if that's the case. I know this for an absolute fact because when I was doing uh, an interview down in Los Angeles, California, and there was another company there. A, a C, so I was being talked to by National Geographic, and then there was CBS, who one of our major networks, they wanted to talk to somebody. And, I mean, Rob Skiba was standing right next to me, literally right next to me. They knew who he was. They knew what he did. And they wouldn't even, they would not talk to him. They went to Patricia and they interviewed Patricia Steer for that segment. And initially they wanted Jaron, but that that, didn't that show you what I'm talking about? I mean, you know, so they went, it's like, okay, they went to Jaron first. Jaron was a no-show. He didn't make it to the meetup. So instead of going to Rob, and Rob would have been a fantastic guy, who had already been done, done part of the ABC segment, they went to Patricia. And that's because they said, well, okay, well, Rob usually specializes in biblical prophecy. So what I do is when I go out there, I mean, yeah, if somebody asks me about chapter and verse, sure, I'll quote it. Sure, you bet. Uh, will I offer it right away? No. Uh, and that's taken mostly from, because I've watched the media over going all the way back to the 80s, um, they're athletes, especially in the United States. Athletes are notorious for, you know, it's like when they win a championship, <laughs> you know, the cameras are right on them. It's live. And it's like, well, first of all, I'd like to thank my, go my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, <laughs> right? Yeah. Which is fine. You know, you want to say that it's fine, but that turns off the media in two seconds. Like, look, my job is to get this thing out to as many people as possible. You want to get them to church? That's your job. I'm, I'm, I got to get them, but to get to you, they, they're going to have to go, you know, they're going to have to use my stuff first to get to you. And that's how they get in. And a lot of people, I, we've, I've heard this time and time again, but from the Christian community, they've never seen a recruiting tool as strong as Flat Earth is. Because if it was built, if we are living in a building, if we're living in a structure, then it was built by someone. And at that point, you're splitting hairs. Are you talking about an advanced civilization or are you talking about the divine? Uh, okay, well, you got to pick one and you go from there. So, sorry, it was my long answer. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, we were talking, sorry, I was talking to, to Nathan earlier, and he wants to thank you for mirroring the QE advert. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Happy to do it. And and by the way, that's that's another thing. What you were talking about, the camps. I know, of course, you know, I I, I, I can't see all of it in real time. But I know there's dissension in the ranks, and I know that there's uh, people out there that, you know, Nathan has evolved into the quintessential antagonist, which is fine. That, that's what he, he's taken. He's taken the troll tactics, and he's used them uh, against them very, very well, which is, which is great. I, I wrote about that in the book. Uh, at the same time, there are other flat earthers that disagree with his methods. It's fine. On any campus, again, we're talking about Flat Earth University. It's a campus. It's an academy. Uh, there, you know, there are uh, instructors who disagree with each other's methods. And that's fine. I mean, that's uh, uh, art through adversity. How, how's that for uh, a solution? Whereas, uh, look, as long as we're all agree at the end of the day, we're still against the globe, I don't mind, which is why I used in the documentary the example of the Scottish Highlands, which you guys know very well, right? Yep. They hacked and slashed each other all day long and flew their own banners. You know, the clans, you know, did not get along. But at the end of the day, they all hated the English. <laughs> That's the point here. At the end of the day, we all hate the globe. The only reason we're not more unified is because science has not put up a unified front against us. And so we're kind of like this restless army that that has a few skirmishes here and there, you know, we're, we're just sitting around. It's like, well, we've got all this enthusiasm. We have to direct it towards somebody. So we kind of direct it towards each other. And uh, Nathan is one of those guys that is going to generate controversy in the future for his tactics. But that's fine. You know, it, I, I'd ra <laughs> let, let me end it with this. I'd rather have him on our side than against us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I say, I mean, I think Flat Earth is mainly... Um, a, 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 like a marmite subject it's like you either love it or you hate it and even the right. trolls that that come in they like the marmite think of it that yeah. way yeah because yeah 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 they love the, the, the troll we have we have a bunch of dedicated troll channels now i mean they're they're in there every week making videos um mostly because it it's positive reinforcement which is if you do and i've seen this m so many times 
whether you do a pro flat earth video, a neutral flat earth video, or a negative flat earth video, you get a lot more hits. If you've never done a flat earth video before, you get a lot of activity. And your comment section goes up exponentially. I mean, there's not only do you get a lot more hits and, and maybe some subs, but the comments, oh man, the activity you generate in there. And that's that's production gold for a lot of people. Um, uh, there was a producer uh, from a radio station I talked to a couple of years ago where uh, at the end we were talking off air and he goes, look, goes, look. he goes, you got to understand. He goes, producers at the end, all they care about it, he goes, it doesn't matter whether you love it or hate it as long as you're talking about it. And that is so true with Flat Earth. You can't. It's so... Find me someone that says, eh, Flat Earth, I don't really care. It's like, what? Yeah, you absolutely do care. I mean, you can tell, but it's like, you know, they, they either have a ton of questions, they want to throw some insults at you, or they're like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to look into this. Or, or or a combination of all three. Usually it's, usually it's all three. They make fun of it first, and then they look into it second, and then, you know, then they're promoting it third. So what do you think about these... Um these trolls that, that that well, I say trolls. They're not trolls, but these these people that that just keep coming around flat Earth and have always got um, are always anti flat Earth. Doesn't matter where they show the, up, they're always there. The the five stages of acceptance, which you hear about in psychology a lot, you know, um, five stages being denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. Um, there's no timetable for this, these five stages. And so there are a bunch of people out there that get stuck in the denial slash anger stage. They never they they're not gonna come out of it until the the peer pressure is so great that they can't help it, where they finally just resign themselves. Be, uh, not until until mainstream comes at them and says, by the way, it's actually flat. <laughs> They're not gonna. They're not gonna. They're gonna stay. Stay fast to their beliefs, which is fine. You know, I, I'd rather what I what I try to tell people is like you know people that make videos against me or other people. Uh, I said, look, I wish I had a thousand more like them, because as long as they're doing it, as long as they're hating you, they're hating you every week. They're generating the metrics. Uh, I, I said this in the, in the book where I said, look, it, I, I came up with this years ago, which I said it's kind of like shooting wooden arrows into a bonfire from a distance it looks like you're actually doing something it looks pretty productive right but at the end you're just adding wood to the fire that's all they're doing on a regular basis and i tell them i go look you you want to hurt flat earth don't talk about it and they can't help it they have to talk about it they're compelled to talk about it and <laughs> so it's like all right well you were warned yeah i am um, you know i mean i'm trying to to to, to find um a, a a midpoint somewhere where that uh the globe earthers can come in and and tell us flat earthers why we're wrong you know i mean bring your evidence to the round table and tell the flat earthers in the in the chat do a presentation tell us something coriolis effect tell us right. about it tell us about it tell right. us about the molten right. iron core tell us how we went to the moon tell us all these different things tell us about gravity you know and i want them to come in and do these presentations and to be fair the globers have stood up and they've come in it's whether they stand up to to the scrutiny of what they bring and what i'm finding is and i think they're probably understanding this too is that there really isn't any scientific proof for what they're claiming it's all just just so stories that they were taught at school right and well i mean reinforcement is such a powerful thing if you're told something you, you've heard from my clues and other people mentioning it's like look you show a globe even if it's a toy globe to a kid in a classroom i'll, I'll use the american flag ex as an example uh, over here in our school system we have in the corner of every class, we have uh, an American flag. And it stays with you, you know, all the way through your, your high school, 12 years, roughly. And below that, somewhere on a table, is a globe. Well, at the end of your 12 years, that flag inspires people to join the military in some cases. You're willing to fight for that flag. That's your home. That's where you live. What's the difference between that and the globe right below you? Uh, it, almost nothing. The the globe preaches the same message. That's where that's your home. That's where you're live. That's where you live. And when somebody challenges that and says, "No, that's not your home," it, there's a real visceral response there, and a lot of people can't get around it. Mm -hmm. So, and when it comes to the people that you know from that come from the science standpoint, um, the one of the quotes I like to throw out there not that I should use, not that I should use Neil deGrasse Tyson too much. But one of the most arrogant things I've ever heard was when he said that science is right whether you believe in it or not. And I said, well, that's fine unless we're talking about the scientific events that have to revolve around money. 
when they rush products to market because of a timetable or because they need to make profit, right? Um, you know, like lead paint, lead gasoline, uh, DDT, and all the other forms of DDT. Um, asbestos, well, that's a fun one. Oh, how about all the, the scientists that lied and said that uh, for money and, and said that cigarettes were, were not bad for us at all? <laughs> You know, science makes cuts corners. Look, scientists are just men like anybody else. They can be corrupted just like anybody else. Don't tell me there isn't a conspiracy in science. Of course there is. There's a conspiracy in every aspect of our life. And I throw that as people all the time. I go, look, we only believe, we all know that the, this world is basically built on lies. And I'm not trying to, this is not trying to be a depressing thing, but come on, I can take your pick. Uh, there's conspiracies in politics, business, sports, entertainment, journalism, uh, and science. Don't think that, that that's not possible. It, it happens all the time. It's just a question of it, there's an, a little imaginary line we draw on the ground and we say, okay, these are the conspiracies I'm willing to look at and here's because they're acceptable conspiracies. And the, the other ones, whoa, that's, that's just too much for me. It's, it's almost like a, like, a, like a drug in some way. You just can't, you just can't take anymore because it, it depresses you. So, yeah, whenever people come back and, and you know, claim things in the name of science, it's like, yeah, but science isn't infallible. They've made mistakes over the year. In fact, I'm going to, um, I'm going to try to open my speech this year with the um, uh, the coelacanth. You, you know about that one? Uh, no, no. Tell us. There's a there's a fish. I'm not going to spell it for you real quick. But it was a, a fish that was fossilized, and every scientist in the world, absolutely, you know, guaranteed, said that, oh yeah, it was it's it was it's been dead for 68 million years dead, gone, forever. You know, 68 million years is a long, 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 long time, right? Yeah. Until they caught one off the shore of Africa in 19, the 1930s. And, you know, even then they're like going, uh, well, it was just a fluke, blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh, and then they kept catching them. And I think they've got up to, I think I, I was looking at the wiki thing, like 90 of them now at this point. So the question is... <laughs> If you were absolutely 100% dead, put in a certificate you can frame wrong about something this something this huge, saying that, the, oh yeah, this species of fish has been de dead for 68 million years, but yet they're still out there now, what sort of credibility does that put into anything else you say about anything, about carbon dating, about the Big Bang Theory, about dark matter, about evolution? How in the world? In fact, that should have just destroyed evolution in some ways because the the, the fossilized remains look identical to the fish. <laughs> They're out there now. And here's where it gets even weirder. If you would, let's say they didn't catch it in the 1930s. Let's say they waited until like 2015, right? Until they caught one. Well, in 2014, if you would have said that, oh yeah, I, my my buddy caught a caught one of these things, you know, off the coast of of, of Africa. They would have laughed you, laughed you out of the room. They said, of course, you're, you're an idiot. These things have been dead for 70 million years. <laughs> so we, we're, you know, so when, when Brian Cox comes out, you know, from your neck of the woods and says he's, he's so against flat earth, he won't even address it. He says it's a myth. <laughs> he says that nobody actually believes in it. Nobody's ever believed in it. It's just a fairy tale that was made up a long, long time ago. And, and so I, I pull up this big thing, uh, this montage of images, these drawn images, and everybody drew the same freaking thing from every culture in every country. So why did they all draw the same thing? Did they all believe in the same myth? Was there this cross-cultural fairy tale? No. It's similar so. to the Yeti story, you know, and also going on from that, there was I watched a documentary, well, not even a documentary, it was more of a, a YouTube a video about 10 minutes long, uh, and it was about this um, uh, biologist that had tagged this nine-foot great white shark. And yeah. they went to track... Uh, no, they found the, the tracker on it uh, washed up on the beach. And when they downloaded the information from it, they found that this shark had... At one minute, it was you know swimming near the surface. And then in a matter of just a, a, a few seconds, had gone from at the surface down to about 1,500 feet depth. And instead of it going colder, it had warmed up and it had stayed in this location, deep depth or, and, uh, uh, around that location for about nine days. And then obviously whatever ate it um, got rid of the waste and out popped the, the tracker and, and the data was able to be recorded. Um, 
turns out, I mean, what can eat a great white shark? Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I know what this is. What this could is eat the, a megalodon? This is, well, okay. Maybe. Yes, that, well, that or, well, I'll, I'll throw a couple alternatives because that was also another one. Um, the giant squid, hmm. for example. The, the giant squid could have done it. Uh, the megalodon could have also done it as well. There are species out there that we don't get to classify because I think whoever finds them... They don't survive the encounter. <laughs> um, the, the the giant squid, for example, we still have never found one officially. We have never found the huge giant squid because they are impossible to catch. The only reason we even knew they existed at all, and up until up until the whaling years, we thought they were myths. We thought they were just you know the, the sailors getting drunk and telling stories. Only when they started whaling sperm whales that would come to the surface, they saw the sucker marks, When because the sperm whales will actually do battle with them and eat them from time to time. The, the sucker marks in the sides of the sperm whales were the size, the size of garbage can lids. And they were going, wow. and, and they were doing the extrapolating and going, this thing's huge, right? And, but yet these things were still battling. You know, the sp- basically as big as a sperm whale. You know, they were basically arch, arch enemies. So, but they're still myths to this day. We, well, I mean, not myths. They know they're down there. They can't find one. I mean, um, the uh, the giant panda was a myth until they found one. Mm. Uh, the um, the billy ape, which is a six foot tall ch- chimpanzee, they only found that like five years ago. Totally a myth. It's like, oh, you know, the the gorilla was a myth before. There's some species out there which avoid humans like the plague. Uh, and I still think there's species out there. I think there's a species of cobra, for example, in South America. I, I, I call it the, the Goliath cobra. I just came up with a name for it because uh, I had heard the stories where I think that, you know, if you're an explorer going through the jungle and you come upon one of these giant cobras, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. Are you going to you gonna be able to go back at home and say, oh, yeah, I found a Goliath cobra? No, you're going to get eaten. <laughs> I'd, like to, so. I'd like them to go yeti hunting one day i hope that they, they i do think they they are they are more likely to be real for sure oh yeah yeah but that. the question is yeah there's some sort of primate no question the question of what the you know from what what abilities do they have because they're really fast uh then they're really wary of people i mean they're really good about not getting caught and i don't know people say well it's a myth and again Anyone that says, oh, no, the, the lo- you know, like, for example, any, anyone that ever gives me grief about, like, the Loch Ness Monster, and which, you know, why you call it Loch Ness Monster, it's like, no, it's a plesiosaur. The question is, why is there a plesiosaur in a freaking lake in Loch Ness, right? Yeah. And w- I go to the seal camp, that fish I was mentioning earlier, <clears throat> which is that fish should have been dead for 68 million years, right? But it's not, <laughs> So when you say a plesiosaur should have been dead for 100 million years, I'm going, okay, <laughs> that fish right there <laughs> makes that plesiosaur a lot more uh, a lot more relevant. And, of course, it, scientists hate the fish, and here's why. They hate the fish that it exists now because it raises questions like, okay, uh, if that fish exists now, what has it been doing for 68 million years? Has it been reproducing? Why aren't the oceans filled with these things? What are their natural predators? What does it eat on a regular basis? You know, what what part of the food chain is this in? And then at that point, can you discount anything else that, that's roaming around the, the waters? Anything that's in the deep lakes? I don't think so. Well, I think Sorry. these um, these films that they put out, um, especially recently, a lot of the a lot of the films that have been put out recently, so they always seem to sort of like come across an island somewhere that has. Uh, beasts that should have been um, extinct, extinct hundreds of millions of years ago, and it sure. feels to me like it's kind of um, pre, pre, you know, sort of like putting the knowledge out so it's more in the mainstream that one day something like this could happen that they could find right. an and, island. And and I think n- not. L- let me close the the book on this topic. Um, I don't think that the, I, I think the carbon dating system is so messed up that I don't think hundreds of millions of years is actually a thing. Yeah, no, uh, I, I hundreds. Agree. It's it's way 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 shorter thousands maybe tens of thousands you know I think there's terraforming in between civilizations but hundreds of millions of years no you don't need that much time to do to do anything and so when you say that oh yeah these dinosaurs whatever and I don't want to get into the whole dinosaur thing um, whatever these fossils are hundred million years ago you know hundred million years old well. It's, uh, it, you can put that date out there if you want but then all of a sudden this fish shows up. And it's like, uh, this kind of puts a wrench into everything you were just saying, 
But uh, again, I could spend hours talking about their stuff. What else you got? Um, your interview with the astronaut guy. Oh, the British one. Yeah. The British interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Your side of that. How it went. The, well, it went about as well as it could considering the circumstances, meaning I was coming in through Skype. And they only told me at the last minute that the American astronaut, Terry Virts was actually going to be in the studio sitting next to Piers Morgan. And I had done enough interviews at that point that you got to realize it's not you versus the host. Because the host is only saying what's happening in his ear. He's only a news reader. It's you're really it's you against the producers. It's, it's you and the producers are in a control room and they've got their finger on a kill switch. And so the whole point for me, and I, I will say I was a little intimidated by Piers Morgan because I'd seen him in other interviews, and he's he's rather, uh, I'll, I'll be nice and say antagonistic. <laughs> he, he likes to push people's buttons. And so I was just waiting for it. I was going, oh, man. I was going, he's going to come after me. He's going to wait for something. He's going to come after me. And he didn't, which was nice, but he kept deflecting everything away from Terry. And he wouldn't let Terry answer the questions. In fact, Terry never did talk to me directly. You know, he, he would never engage me. He had no questions for me. He, he And any questions I had for him, they went through peers. Very deliberate, and that was fine. My goal for that show, kind of like was um, how I get people into Flat Earth, my goal for the show was to make it through the show. You know, make it through my 10 minutes and hopefully not get kicked off. Because at any point, they could have cut me off and said, uh, oh, yeah, you know, if I would have said anything. Because people said, oh, you know, why didn't you attack? Why didn't you why didn't you go after Terry with everything you had? And I go, because the producer I would have if I would have been in the studio. But I wasn't in the studio. I was in Skype. They could have cut me off and said, Oh yeah, we lost Mark. We don't know. We'll try to get him back after the break. Never would have gotten me back. <laughs> so doing it, that's fine. They could see me, but I couldn't see them. That was also something they did. It was a cool cool little trick where there was a camera where I could see peers and everybody. And then at the last second they bumped that camera. And pointed it towards a curtain, so I had no idea what I was looking at. I can only hear them. Wow. Um, but it was fine. I mean, I was I was happy to do it, and the exposure was worth it. And that that particular TV thing led to a bunch of UK radio interviews. So, and again, if if anyone that says that, oh yeah, they would have done so, something completely different on on air with with them, it's like fine, you know, go ahead and do that. Let me know how it goes. Yeah, I mean, they say there's no there's no bad publicity, publicity with publicity. Yeah, I mean, heck, it was it was Piers Morgan. I I was I just you know he had done a stint over here in the states on uh, CNN for a while, and uh, I I was just grateful again, lucky that by the end you know he didn't you know he took a couple shots you know asking if I was an American because I was picking on an American astronaut. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, I probably should have jumped in and said, you know, why why does the UK not have an astronaut program? And I think mostly it's because they knew better, and they're like, yeah, we're not going to get involved in this in this theater. The thing it's is, just not, you've got to go you've ahead. got to be you've got to juggle a tightrope because at any minute, I mean, I know that you do get you get you get these sort of we'll call them gigs for now. You get these gigs on a good show. So you've got a yeah. good show, so you've got a good morning Britain and all this kind of stuff, but you do yeah. have to walk a tightrope. So it's like you can't go in for the kill. If you went in for the kill, you would never be invited back somewhere else. If you you're don't. you're absolutely right, yeah. which is – that's also something people don't know, and that is it has nothing to do with the people you see on camera. Those are not the people that make the decisions. It's the people that call you. It's not that Piers Morgan called me. He, Piers Morgan didn't even know the hell I was until five minutes before air. It was um, it was the producers. And if you do well with a producer, if you know if you make it through the show, all they care about is if the show goes smoothly, right? And it's like okay, we we run our segment. Both sides get their point across. Nobody loses it. Nobody lunges across a desk. Starts swinging. And if you do well, those producers get talked to other producers. And that has happened to me time and time again, where other producers call, you know, they call up and say, oh, yeah, how did that Mark Sargent do? Oh, yeah, he was good to work with. Perfect. Great. I mean, that, and that's how I've gotten most of my interviews, where, you know, because the media is lazy. Media will, um, they'll look and say, okay, we want to interview somebody up Flat Earth. Intern, go search. <laughs> and the intern searches, and they, pot, and they all they do is, like, type, they type in Flat Earth interview. 
and they'll they'll look and they'll listen to see who's ever done an interview, and uh, if they say, oh yeah, this uh, guy sounds pretty good, boom, you're on. That's it. And so when people give me grief, it's like, well, how'd you get so many interviews? I go, oh, because I put my name, my phone number out there, and I give some pretty good interviews. So yeah. That's that's all you have to do. I mean, you'd be surprised how if you do not have your name, your real name and your phone number, no offense to you, of course, mm -hmm. if you don't have, but if you want to get out there, if you actually want to do interviews, you have to put your name and phone number out there so that people can get a hold of you or at least your email address. I mean, Eric, for example, Eric DeBay, oh my God, he didn't have his stuff out there for the longest time. And Matt Boylan, he was notorious for like avoiding the press because he, he thought he could just jump in at any time. And I'm going, no, man, it's about Windows. If you don't get in fairly quickly, they're not going to care. And he ignored me. So, Like I say, it's, it's this, it's this tightrope that you dance, you know. So I can understand from your point of view, which is you've got to keep these uh, producers on the side and you've got to come across yeah. as being able, as, as a malleable kind of guest. Yep. And you and know. thank you, by the way, for saying that. That's the combat I get most often, <laughs> which is malle malleable and the versions of malleable. <laughs> you know, e e easy going, easy to work with. Um, the the guy that wrote me uh, or wrote about me in an article when I was down in New Zealand, um, it might as well be a T-shirt. He he, I've never seen someone, but I I ask people about this, and they say, oh yeah, this is pretty much it. They say uh, Mark has a goofy warmth. Mm. That inst instantly disarms you, mm. and I go. I'll take it. <laughs> sure, why not? I'm not Brad Pitt, but by God, you know you uh, you'll I, you know will end up having a dialogue where other people you wouldn't. Mm. But yeah, so but that you know so so the, I think uh, from the flat Earth community we have to understand the situation that you're in i mean i do i understand that situation that you're in so i understand that you can't go for the kill every time that you're in there no you know? and and why why would you that's why you have you know like when you're talking left wing or right wing why you have white right wing ring wow wow right wing extremists versus left wing extremists right that's the whole point you've got people that you could send out that you want to just yell and get in their face uh, you know, there's there's other people that don't. That's not my job. People that the people that, that you want, you know, if you're watching television or you're listening back and you 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 don't want to be jarred. You just want to watch the TV. It's like, oh, this is kind of interesting. You don't want me like yelling in your face, pointing at the camera. <laughs> that that would not go over very well. And that's again, it's not it's not what I do. That I specialize in just kind of an easygoing dialogue and and trying to be as articulate and credible as possible. First line of defense. First line of defense. Bring people in, and then it's up to the rest of the community how they <laughs> they find the way around flat Earth, like you've said. It's, right. It's, it's right. Entirely which is them. which is why you know so far we've been really fortunate where we haven't come off. You know, even during the conferences, we haven't come off as this fringe cult. You know, we're not chanting or wearing robes. We don't have a compound or anything like that. So it's been tough for the media to to villainize us. Now they've been trying recently, only with the whole kids. Oops, sorry. Hang on. Sorry, I don't know who. I think it was a solicitor that was calling in. Um, uh, they've been trying to they've been trying to do the whole kid angle and and trying to say, oh, you know, well, if the kids are involved, we don't want them influencing our youth. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, no, we're not trying. We don't have any dedicated children's programs that are that are being made. And YouTube videos can be watched by anybody. And, and Flat Earth is, is really tame compared to a lot of videos that are out there. And YouTube has no age restriction. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do? You're, you're not going to be able to do much there either. And we haven't burned down any libraries. We haven't blown up anything. So, so far, it's been really, really smooth. And I, I hope to hope it continues like that. Yeah, and what would you think was the easiest thing to debunk? I mean, for me personally, it has to be NASA and the moon landing. Oh, you mean if you're going to go after something? Yeah, if you had to go after something, a couple of things. Obviously, I think I believe. Um, yeah, in fact, NASA. I'll I'll drop something into chat right here for you, which is I send this to people sometimes, which what? is yeah, NASA is the easiest thing to debunk in the world. It, the The shot I just sent you was just a a, a random image I'm looking at from Apollo 12. Right, and I t I show people this image, right? And this is an actual shot from from NASA. 
I say I can find at least six things wrong with this image and I can talk about them for two minutes to an hour if you want me to. The question is why, and, and then I ask, I go, how many things can you find wrong with this image? And it's a trick question. There shouldn't be anything wrong with this image at all. It shouldn't just be, you know, it should be as is, but there's a lot of things that don't make sense from a photography standpoint, from a physics standpoint, from an engineering standpoint. There's tons of, I mean, Apollo aged horribly. And and the whole moon mission really helped us in the end because people have been tearing apart the moon missions ever since they stopped in 1972. So ever since then, people have been, you know, they used to go to UFO conventions and say, oh, yeah, there's something wrong. And, of course, the stories came up that there's actually aliens on the moon and uh, different little side roads. But in the end, it helped us because there was always this doubt in the Apollo program. And I doubted it, too. I just couldn't come up with a good enough reason why you would fake it. Why fake Apollo? Why would you fake the moon mission? And only when I got into Flat Earth. Did, did I have a reason that was good enough for me, which was you didn't want to fake it, you had to fake it. Because if you don't fake it, eventually you're going to have corporations, uh, the major military contractors, somebody's going to go up there from the private sector and try, try to make it to the moon, and then they're going to realize they can't. And so you have to militarize space, you release these images and hope to God they age well. They aged about as well as they could, and then the internet came on, and now we're to the point where we're sharing details instantly back and forth to each other and it's all unraveling yeah paul on the plane's pretty good at dissecting them he did a presentation on i think it was episode maybe 15 or 14 he did a presentation on why we didn't go to the moon and he used i think that image was was part of that um but lastly i want to talk about um is it do you believe in the simulation theory am i right or i do i do i talked about it in the last chapter of the book um, again, which is coming out next month. In fact, I'll drop, you know, just for you, I will drop in the cover for this thing. It's not out yet. Oh, right. Uh, okay. So this will be... But a... I, will drop, I will drop in the cover for you right about here. And come on, get in there. <laughs> so is this an exclusive? So, is this an exclusive? This is an exclusive right there. There's, there's the cover, cover of the book. The... Um, I do talk about it because, remember, I'm a, I'm a tech guy, and I was in the tech field for decades. Oh, exactly. And, I mean, I cut my teeth on it. That's really what I did for a career. Not only did I do um, uh, game production, but I also did time and attendance software training, and then I did internet research. I was always in tech in, in some way. And what I try to tell people is, if it is flat and it's enclosed, there is a high degree of probability... And sci mainstream science will jump on this as well. There's a high degree of probability that it's digital, that it's some sort of simulation. Now, does that make any difference? Not so much because the average person can't understand it anyway. I mean, unless you've done some programming, it's not going to make much difference to you, which is why I don't preach it on a regular basis. Uh, I try to, to make it as simple as possible. And so I have to start off with the most simple concept, which is it's flat. And, and you've got to start there. Because all simulations that we make are flat. Everything from uh, Grand Theft Auto to Warcraft to Fortnite, take your pick. Everything is built in a flat, and in fact, it's not just flat, but it's in a box. Uh, in fact, the, I, I've been telling people when they, when they say, well, you know, what, what's the sun and the moon and the stars and stuff? I go, well, if it's in a simulation, it's just part of the skybox. Because computers can't draw circles. They can't draw domes. They draw squares. They, they, the computer, try to tell a computer to draw a circle. You can't, you can't be done. Right? You, there's no technical way to do it. It has to draw just little tiny, it's why pixels are square. You can make the pixels smaller and smaller and smaller to where they can't even see them, but they're still squares. Um, and that's kind of where I, I leave people off, where it's like, look, there's a lot of scientific principles out there which scream simulation. Not, again, not that it matters because we're inside it. So from my point of view, it doesn't matter if we're in the simulation or not. As long as you're inside it, it's still as real as anything. So there's no point really trying to break down the simulation. With the exception of, and I'll leave you with this, um, there's three different things out there that go along the simulation uh, theory. One, of course, is the double slit experiment, especially the single electron gun experiment from like so 15 years ago, which says that anything that's behind you, anything you're not looking at with your own eyes, isn't being... Um, rendered as detailed as, as it could and that's what the double slit experiment says 
Um, quantum mechanics, which talks about, especially the polarity experiments, which basically say that there's something out there that's faster than the speed of light, which goes into a whole other thing. And um, the third one, which escapes my head right off the bat, which was, oh, I'm sorry, neuroscience and free will, which is a fascinating. If you want to look up something really, really cool, look up something. I mean, the double slit experiment, you'll get that eventually. It'll take people a while. Quantum physics, don't even look at that. But um, you want to look at something interesting, look at neuroscience and free will. Have you ever heard of this? Uh, no. Okay, neuroscience and free will is, you know, like, like all science experiments, they, science does things just because they can, not because they should. So they hook up people, you know, like a sci-fi movie, they hook up electrodes to people's heads all the time and have them do all sorts of things. And they were hooking up electrodes to um, people's heads and they were having them choose numbers on a computer, right? Like, pick a number. And they also said, make sure you note the time in 10 seconds and tenths of seconds that um, when you decide to choose the number. So it's like, I'm going to choose the number three, and then you click the number three, right? So there's this little gap between the time you choose, the you, time you decide on the number, and the time you hit the, the key, right? Mm -hmm. And what they found out was, is that the brain waves, all, all, the, all the sensors in the brain waves were showing that you actually made the decision eight seconds before you actually consciously made the decision. Okay. So it's like you think of a number between 1 and 10 right now, right? And you say, we'll just say 2, right? Eight seconds before you even decided that it was 2, your brain was already processing that. So you're thinking, okay. wait, that's not possible. That, that just screams predestination, right? And, that, and science had a real, real problem with this. And, and it's out there. You can look it up. It's on Wiki. They have a real problem with this because science doesn't believe in predestination, which means that the, in this, well, let's leave it at this. It's it's not that you may not just be in a simulation, you know, like a like a you may be in a simulated movie. Meaning, why would you be in a simulation that randomly where where all the choices you know you're you're doing them on the fly, kind of like a pre-record versus a, a live thing? Why not just pre-record the whole thing? That way you can make all the choices in advance. You leave nothing to chance. It's kind of, you know, goes into that whole, you know, um, uh, parallel future things. And that is, uh, to use a line from the Matrix, you didn't come here to make the choice. You already made it. You're yeah. here to understand why you made it. And science has found this. They found this out there with their own tests. We didn't come up with this. They came up with this. So, yeah, yeah. Do I believe in some sort of simulation thing at the highest levels? Yes. But do I delve into them that much? No, because most of the people that I talk to they have a hard enough time just getting their head around, as you know, getting their head around flat earth. Yeah. But that's where it starts for me. And then after that, I mean, yeah, it's a physical flat earth. No question. From the inside, absolutely physical and real. And and with most people, I say, yeah, that's where you should probably stop. Because that's, you know, outside of that, it's mostly speculation anyway. Do you think there's a, a conspiracy that's greater than flat earth? I mean, do you think there's the hollow earth for instance no i don't think the hollow earth is is greater than flat earth because hollow earth is just part of it hollow earth is under it which means can you can previous civilizations that lived here before us and we all know they're out there you know we, we've and science just doesn't want to talk about the sunken cities off of japan and and india and the bosnian pyramids and the real pyramids we know that there's been civilizations that have lived before us the question is where did they go if if any of there were any survivors did they mingle with us or did they go underground so, uh, could there be a hollow earth thing? Sure. Is, is, is hollow earth bigger than flat earth? No. But the only thing bigger than flat earth is the, um, the afterlife, which is what happens outside. And I'm not saying after death, I'm saying what's outside of here. That's the only thing bigger than flat earth. What's outside of our world? Because whatever it is, is much, much bigger than what we have now. Yeah, I think, I think the, you know, the, the, this is a meat suit, essentially. You know, right. whatever we learn here is just a drop in the ocean to, to our potential yep. and where we're going to end up. You know, I definitely agree with that. Uh, yeah, I, I believe there's an unlimited universe outside of here. I mean, this world is 99.9% .9 conflict. It, it's almost inescapable. It doesn't matter how rich, how powerful, how beautiful, how talented you are. You always have some sort of conflict, always something to complain about. Isn't that a little odd? Mm -hmm. And it only happens with human beings. Um, you know, this world, if you took out human beings, would run absolutely flawlessly all the time. 
and we're the only ones that have problem with it. So again, I, I think it's kind of like a wildlife reserve, like a meat soup. What you're saying? Yeah, I um I remember as a, as a kid being told that animals um can't think really. They're not they're, they're dumb. They don't do anything. They don't. They've got no intelligence, etc., uh, etc. Et we're the only ones with intelligence. But as the as time has progressed and we've we've obviously got YouTube and stuff, you actually see when you watch these animal videos and such that they are conscious absolutely conscious and they have you know they care for their family and their friends and it doesn't matter whether they're a wild animal a dog cat horse uh lion it doesn't matter they've all got this inner feel you know uh especially some of the creatures the dolphins for instance there's another one of course you know the, of course. these are highly highly intelligent creatures just in a different body but it's clear right. that they do have a, a capacity to think yeah yeah, I would agree. Uh, maybe one day, or maybe we we won't be able to, won't be allowed to develop that technology, which is, you know, can you read the minds of of uh, other creatures, and then find out exactly how far, you know, where the differences are. Uh, I I don't think we'll ever be allowed to go that far because I think it leads to some of the keys to this world, and we're here to learn something, but we're not allowed to cheat. Mm. So, uh, but yeah, I agree with you. I, I think there's some fantastic life forms, but they, again, not to use a line from the Matrix, they all seem to, though, to develop a, a natural equi equilibrium with their surrounding environment, and we do not. Exactly. Right, well, Mark, I'm going to wrap this up. So is there anything you want to talk about before another couple of minutes? Just anything you want to talk about, where people can find you, what shows you're doing, where you're going? Uh, yeah, just, just Google Flat Earth Clues. My, my little podcast is called Strange World. It's on True Frequency Radio. The books are called Flat Earth Clues. Uh, in fact, the second book is going to be Flat Earth Clues, End of the World. The first one was called Sky's the Limit. And I will be, the, the next public things I'm doing are Seattle. I'm going to be at a meetup down at Bonnie Lake. There's a promo for that on my website. That's going to be September 1st. I'm going to be in the UK from the 7th to the 16th. I'm doing the conference there. I'm going to be doing part of the Globe Light Tour. Then I'm going over to the Gather Festival in Stockholm on the 12th. I'm coming back for Flattober Quest, which is um, Flattober Quest? Is that what it's called? <laughs> Flat, Flattober Fest, which is Karen B's uh, conference, which is going to be in South Carolina October 21st, I believe. And then finally, the, the big conference in Dallas, Texas in November 14th and 15th. Okay. Oh, and seeing as he actually mentioned that, because I actually forgot about that, um, the the tour. So the, there's going to be yes. a tourathon uh, this Saturday and Sunday. So. Yep, I'm I'm part of it. You're a part of that, yeah. So. Yep, I'm gonna I'm gonna be on the Karen B part because I don't generally do live streams uh, for security reasons, uh, and I will be doing it with Karen for a couple hours, I believe, this Saturday. Wow. Wow. We've had a massive super chat, actually. Thank you very much from Sam Hain, who's just dropped a hundred dollars in. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much. Nice. Really do appreciate that. So this this twenty four hour this is a twenty four hour tourathon, and it's going to be a, a bunch of different channels. So I know that you and Karen B are, are, are scheduled in for two hours of that. House, so I believe, and yep. then hopefully we're going to get channels like Globusters, um, Jeronism. Um, Deep inside the rabbit hole, whole bunch, you know, all the channels that people are, are familiar with uh, to oh, do by, a little segment. By the way, um, Karen B just messaged me. Apparently, she's, she's listening to this, and she says, "Correction, the uh, Flattober Fest is on the twentieth, not the twenty-first. Oh, right. Okay. So, thank you, thank you for that, Karen. <laughs> just correcting you there. <laughs> yep. So, well, it was supposed to. Be, I think it was supposed to be for two days, and I had it down for two days, but it's actually on the twentieth, not the twenty-first. Cool. Um, well, well, as I say, this this twenty four hour tour on it's to, to to help fund the the Globe Light tour. So there will be um, a bus that's essentially traveling around the whole U of the UK, um, and then it appears, or it's it's going to be um, a, a relay once it gets to uh, to Europe. Are you aware of that, Mark? I am aware of that. Sounds really cool, ambitious. It is, and this relay is going to be. Uh, a bunch of different flat earthers, including people, and not limited to myself, who will take a, a segment of that uh, for I think three days. 
So as the tour goes throughout Europe, um, it's going to be handed over to a different flat earther in a different country. So it's going nice. to go from country to country and it's going to be handed over to a different channel, different flat earther who's going to do a segment on the tour. And literally, I can't wait for it. I honestly can't wait for it. Um, cool. I know the Adam Meekin, he'll be doing a, t a stint on the tour. I think Jaron's doing a stint on the tour as well. So literally, it'll be just Jaron driving the van for three days and, uh, you know, stopping off in a different country and telling people why the earth is flat. Nice. <laughs> it is. It's a bit ambitious, but, you know, they need funding for it, essentially. So this is why we're doing this tour-a-thon, to try and... Um, get some money together so that they can afford the fuel for the journey because it's going to take a lot of fuel to do that that trip. I bet, I bet. So anyway, thank you, uh, thank you uh, for stopping by there, Mark. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. Happy to do it. I hope I wasn't too brutal with you. <laughs> no, no, no. It's great. Are you kidding? I, 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 really, seriously. After after the amount of these I've done, I'm, I, I. I'm I'm just looking for for dialogue on a regular basis, and I'm I'm actually I look forward to these. Yeah, well, I, I'd welcome you back any time that you you would feel like stopping by. Um, okay. In the meantime, um, I have to thank you for stopping by and taking this time out to have a little chat with the audience and let people know that you're still still here and doing your thing. And uh, you know, there we go, big thumbs up. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> No, right. thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much. And, and uh, everybody out there, you know, it's going to be a fun rest of the year. Uh, big, big finish for 2019. Good stuff. Good stuff. So going ahead uh, later on the week, I'm hoping, hoping, fingers crossed, to get a couple of presentations in on Friday. Um, so hopefully one from a flat earther and hopefully one from a globe earther. So stay cool. tuned for that. And I might do um, a, chit, a bit of a chit chat, flat earth chit chat this time on the weekend. I'm actually in conversation with a globe earther who isn't um, to doesn't have a YouTube channel, but he's very keen on being uh, the globe earth voice um, for their participations on the uh, the discussions, including the aftermath show and any chit chats that go ahead with the the globe side. So. That's all in the works, and hopefully I'll have some news for you with that for next week. So, thank you everyone for stopping by. Thank you, Mark, and I will see you all in the next one. All right. Thanks, man. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.